In the year 481, a great war had unraveled that grasped the whole continent of Eastald into its clutches. A war for the sake of unification and the greatest weapons being the fairy soldiers, humans who had undergone a fairy organ transplant, enabling them to summon fairies during battle. In the midst of this gruesome war, the fairy village of Suna was burned down to ashes by a knight named Ray Dawn. Two children, Veronica Thorne and our protagonist, Malia Noel, had survived by running towards the woods on that frosty, snow-clad night. And for 24 years, the war would rage on, only ending upon the full unification of Eastold under the Emperor of Zeskia. It would only be after the war in the year 505 where we find Malia Noel. Here in the country of Fuzan, a former territory of Kalo, an auction takes place. The bidding has started when Malia goes backstage with a hunting rifle swung over her shoulder and looks through the auction objects. Free Underbar, a former fairy soldier, comes after her, asks if she is from the Koklu family. Malia seems to remember a rumour about him being a member of Gui Karlin, a mafia group. Currently, he is head of security. He reminds her to go back to her post to guard. However, Malia excitedly starts petting an auction animal in a cage named Chima. Free informs her that it can detect fairies or their distinct scent. Outside, during the auction, a manuscript of a fairy book, the Black Fairy Tome, gets sold for two million gaily. Malia's eyes fall on a bottle with fairies floating in it. Free tells her that the bottle is of top-notch quality since it enables humans to see these fairy primordial, otherwise the naked eye cannot detect them. Meanwhile, Chima escapes from its cage. Malia is perplexed and quickly relays that maybe the cage had already been left open. A loud bang interrupts them. The culprit is none other than Veronica. She is causing terror amongst the audience by killing one of the staff members with the help of her fairy, Blood Daughter. She proceeds to snatch the tome and with excellent agility slashes a security guard's arm before he can even fire at her. She summons her fairy and kills him, all the while refusing to give away her name. People start running, fearing for their lives. Malia and Free make their way to the stage. Free is taken aback when he sees a fairy. He starts fighting it with his sword. The place is in utter chaos. Veronica's fairy is humongous. Free definitely hasn't seen one like it before. Marilla realizes that it's her childhood friend, Veronica. She yells for Veronica as relief washes over her to finally have found her. However, Veronica isn't too excited by their encounter and starts fighting Free. He decides to summon his fairy named Red Hood. Malia tries to break their fight, but they don't listen. Veronica makes a run for it and Malia starts chasing after her in hopes to talk to her, but it's all in vain. Veronica bitterly tells her that she needs to forget her because the girl she knew from her hometown is no more. The security opens fire at Veronica as she runs through the crowd. Free tries to yell at them to stop. Veronica once again slashes their arms and kills them. Free is busy getting the crowd to safety. One of the guards starts shooting at Veronica, but Blood Daughter appears in front of her for protection. A bullet hits one of the fairy bottles hanging from the ceiling. Malia jumps into action to save it. The fairy possesses her. She goes into a dreamlike state and flashbacks begin of her days with Veronica in their village and of that fateful day when Ray Dawn burned it to ashes. Just when it all becomes too overwhelming for Malia, the fairy Ashclad comes to her rescue. She finds herself waking up on the auction floor while Chima stares at her. She's reminded of Veronica and immediately gets up to look for her. Veronica and Free fight under the moonlit sky. She makes a remark about him being an artifact the war has left behind. He is quick to point out about her capturing a fairy and is a threat to humanity. He proceeds to slash her right cheek and commands Red Hood to attack. However, Blood Daughter is a tough one and withstands the blow. They are interrupted by Malia firing at them. She encourages Veronica to come join her because she had to go through all this trouble of joining the Mafia for the sole purpose of finding her. Veronica, with her resentment for the past, rejects her offer and tells Malia to stop calling her by the nickname Ver. Their fairies start fighting again. Ashclad makes an appearance for the first time between the other two fairies. She grabs their wrists and burns them. Everyone is left shocked at the fact that Malia has a fairy now. She herself is left confused at the fact and is left to wonder why. In the midst of all this, Veronica has already disappeared into the night. Free blurts out that he had infiltrated into Guy Calrin and in reality belongs to the organization called Dorothea. Malia has heard of it working under the government for catching illegal fairy activities, 
to stop people like Veronica, who has used a fairy and has run off with the black fairy tome. Then there is Malia, whose entire existence is a crime in itself since she can use a fairy without any medical intervention. Malia worriedly asks if he would throw her into jail. However, he gives her a choice, either end up behind bars or join the organization just like him. She takes his hand and agrees to do the latter. Malia makes it clear that she still wants to actually talk to Veronica. In UE 491, Malia is still just a kid and left all alone. She considers herself extremely unlucky. The village people had given her the name Little Disaster because trouble followed her. Her parents died when she was born. Then the people who raised her had died during the war. Veronica had even disappeared, leaving her behind. In UE 487, six years after the war had started, Free volunteers to become a fairy soldier and is brought to the research facility where he gets introduced to Red Hood, caged away. The doctor explains that Red Hood's fairy organ will be placed into Free's body, making them one. Later, during the war in UE 491, Free's comrade Jet Grave dies protecting him. Free mourns next to his lifeless body. Present day UE 505 Rondasia, Malia practices her firing while Free discusses her matter with Nine Aula the director and first unit commander of Dorothea, also one of the seven knights who each represented their country. She simply cannot believe that a fairy could somehow possess someone without the need of an organ transplant. However, she wants to keep the information to herself just in case and orders Free to write another report on Malia, leaving out the fairy bit. At the artificial fairy factory in former territory of Timon, we find the former fairy soldier Wolfran Rowe, who is supervising a deal of giant armor soldiers referred to as artificial fairies. He jokes about another war happening if the order had gotten any bigger than it already is. On the other hand, Malia and Free are on a train. He inquires if finding Veronica was the only reason she joined the Mafia. It sounds about right. He assures her that working in Dorothea will lead her to Veronica at some point, however, as enemies. They set out for the rest of the way on a bike. Free informs her that the RK Mafia group supplies artificial fairies to their sellers. Dorothea's aim is to uncover the buyer along with the artificial fairies. These things were used during the war as a replacement for actual soldiers. They make it to Dipra Ruins, a former territory of Ledrad. There they join two other members from the organization Serge Tova from the first unit and Clara Kisanaria also from the first unit. She has her fairy Tomaris on watch for any signs of the Arkham Mafia. They arrive shortly with three vehicles loaded with the artificial fairy soldiers. Clara detects one of them being a fairy soldier. He looks their way, most likely spotted Tomarese. Free instructs the unit members to lay low for now. He tells Malia to follow the fairy soldiers, leaving the other two to keep up their surveillance. Turns out, the fairy soldier outsmarts them and traces his steps back to the initial point. Free and Malia catch up to him just in time. Free attacks him with Red Hood, and is left astonished when he sees Wolfran's fairy Fitcher. He starts questioning Wolfran's integrity and asks about his wife and daughter. The latter doesn't respond and switches to attack Malia. Ashclad is quick to protect her but loses both her arms in the process. <coughs> Serge comes to their rescue with his fairy blind tail. Wolfran decides to escape from the scene. Ashclad is still defensive and he's about to attack Free, but Malia is quick to remove her from there. Free informs Malia that he and Wolfran were comrades during the war, but can't figure out why the latter chose to stoop so low. Malia and Free go after the Mafia. Wolfran reaches the vehicle and informs them about Dorothea. The dealer decides to release three of the artificial fairy soldiers to fight against them. They get activated with the blow of a whistle. To worsen the circumstances, Ashclad isn't able to come out due to the heavy blow she received earlier. Free tells Malia to give her cover and feel free to shoot right at the artificial fairy soldiers since they aren't humans. Red Hood severs the head of one and Free is busy fighting the other two. While Malia is trying to figure out which part of the fairy soldiers to fire at, Clara is able to lock down their battle coordinates. This enables Serge's fair to shoot from a long range. It successfully gets rid of the second artificial fairy. Free takes down the last one and they don't even get the time to catch a break because Wolfran decides to make his entry while standing on top of one of the vehicles. Wolfran shoots the dealer so that he won't cause any problems for him when caught and runs away on another vehicle. Free is able to catch up to it. The vehicle crashes. 
He runs to get the driver out, only to see him being shot by Wolfran as well. The man takes his last breath after a few seconds. Free sits there, laughing at his once friend's thoroughness. The man didn't leave behind any loose threads, even if it meant taking the lives of those that worked with him. UE 481 Ladrad, during the Great War of Unification, the nations created their own fairy soldiers. They hunted down the fairy imaginals, the creatures themselves, till they almost went extinct. About 300 fairy soldiers were created, they were treated like murder weapons, and they fought with each other till their last breaths. After the war came to an end, according to Unified Zeskia, only 17 fairy soldiers made out alive. During the last days of the Great War in UE 495, Wolfran goes to visit Branhut in Ledrad, where his family resided, only to find out that the war had snatched the lives, leaving behind the ruins of their home. He breaks down crying, wondering if it's all retribution. Present day UE 505 Isharat, a former territory of Timun, under the ruins of Connor Church Graveyard, an underground illegal artificial fairy factory is present. Wolfran meets up with Colonel B.V. Leskar, an agent of war and mercenary. He is one of the seven knights from the Great War. They each represented their country and were given the honor to use a fairy weapon. His reaction to these fairy soldiers is definitely boastful, calling them ugly creatures. He raises a question upon Wolfran's position and belittles him. When Dorothea members go to investigate the place, it has been wiped clean. Nothing is left for them to take into custody. In Rondatia, an arcane mafia member and informant, Axel Laboon is running for his life. He comes to a dead end and gets cornered by Free. Turns out he is the mole who had ratted out Arcane Mafia's transaction. Free lets him get away, but on the condition of looking into Wolfran. At the Unified Ministry of Fairies, Malia and Free have been called to the office of Vice Minister Marco Bellwood. It's about the stolen Black Fairy Tome. Malia questions if the tome exists in any other colour. To this, the Vice Minister gives a brief history about it. He informs them that the term Fairy Tome, when used alone, refers to the certified text published by Alan Bach. The first original text was written by the first fairy scholar, Hell S. Bellwood. J. B. Mercer wrote the Blue Fairy Tome. Then there is the Red Fairy Tome by Timothy Connor, White Fairy Tome by Colin Thor, and lastly, Crucia Albastora's Black Fairy Tome. Alan Bach decided to compile them all 200 years ago. Now the problem is that the text of the Black Fairy Tome isn't present in that certified text, and has been stolen and it is said that the Black Fairy Tome is on fairy possessions. Since the Ministry of Fairies deals with all sorts of fairy-related things, its disappearance is a major concern. The Vice Minister wants them both to visit a fairy scholar named Cain Disterol in Isharat because he has been able to obtain the Black Fairy Tome. They are walking towards his house when they encounter Sweetie Bitter Sweet, a businesswoman and Goy Calrin's associate member. Free somehow seems a bit uncomfortable in her presence. He tells Malia that she works for the Mafia, but she outright disagrees and calls herself an adventurous businesswoman. Axel watches from afar. Just when he thought stealing the Black Fairy Tome from Cain would be an easy feat, these three make an appearance. Poor guy sure is having a tough time. The trio goes inside to meet Cain. He warmly greets Sweetie. After a bit of small talk, the topic shifts to the Black Fairy Tome. Kane instructs Damien Crame, his late colleague's son, also a scholar, to bring it out. Damien puts a small werewolf like Fae Primordial on display for them. They're all immersed in discussion while Axel is busy climbing the tower to get inside house. He summons his fairy bird named Pilly Wiggin for distraction and steals the case containing the Black Fairy Tome. Sweetie, Malia and Free run after him. As soon as the tiny fairy tries to protect Axel, Sweetie chops it in half. Axel starts running wildly, but Sweetie is right behind him. The security force arrives shortly. Free introduces himself and asks them to lend a hand with capturing Axel. Axel finally throws the case towards Sweetie, but it's empty when she opens it. This cunning man has the tome pages in his pocket. The cat and mouse chase resumes yet again. Damien and Veronica watch it all from a balcony. He is amused with the commotion. Unbeknownst to the rest, these two might actually be working together and with the way Kane helped to set it all up, they sure did make a fool out of the rest. Veronica informs him that Malia might have been fairy possessed. Axel's body is about to give up on him from all the running. While on the other hand, Sweetie hasn't even broken a sweat. Free joins them as well. 
Sweetie points out how he has become the government's little pet after all the damage it has done during the war. Free isn't phased by her remark. Axel takes this as an opportunity to quickly slip away, but Sweetie shoots him. He throws the pages on the ground between them like meat. Free and Sweetie starts fighting while he finally gets to escape. Malia joins them from a rooftop. She interrupts them by firing the rifle. Sweetie releases her fairy, Skryker. Malia fires at it, but it throws the rifle from her hands, all the while still not moving from its place. Free is taken aback by this while Sweetie stands amused. Free's fairy Red Hood joins them and starts fighting with Skryker. Free realizes that whatever damage gets done to her fairy is reversed because Red Hood ends up being on the receiving end of his own attack. Malia jumps in the middle of their fight with her fairy. She is still unaware of Skryker's ability. Free tries to stop her, but it's already too late. Ash Clad ends up getting burned instead, causing Malia to fall weak from the intensity of it. Sweetie walks away, leaving behind the black fairy tome pages. Free helps Malia and acknowledges her effort. During the Great War, when Ray Dawn ordered Fasuna to be burned to ashes, he made sure to get rid of the two fleeing girls by ordering his soldiers to set the forest aflame. Veronica had told Malia to run away while she distracted the soldiers, assuring little Malia that since she is a fast runner, they won't be able to catch her. That was the last time Malia saw her. Well, of course, until the auction night. Present day, UE 505 at Kane's house, Malia sleeps while dreaming about her childhood days with Veronica. The latter stands outside the door but decides not to go inside. Free goes out looking for clues from the previous night. He only finds a button in a puddle of blood. The blood is Axel's but the button isn't. It might belong to the person that carried the injured man back to safety. Meanwhile, at the holy city of Hapstadt, Duke of Hybrands, Schwartz Dies, inquires with Director Auler whether the investigation regarding Free infiltrating the Mafia has come to an end or not. He wants her to drop the formality of calling him Duke since they were once subordinates, and that if it were him, he wouldn't hide a thing. She tells him that she will be giving the report to the government and that at the end of the day she is only doing her job. Later during the day, Sweetie gives Patricia Pearl, a Gui Carlin Mafia member, the task to steal the Black Fairy Tome for her. Malia is finally able to wake up. Free wants her to take things easy. She inquires about the Black Fairy Tome. Free thinks it might be a fake one, unless the Ministry of Fairies confirms it, but a lot of fake ones have been circulating due to its rarity and importance. It must have been portrayed the same way at the auction. Veronica did steal it, but there were no break-in details. So Veronica could be at the place where the Black Fairy Tome was found because she was the last person to take it. Malia hopes that maybe the scholars might know about her whereabouts. They confront the scholars about it, but they hesitantly relay that they won't be able to disclose any information and they definitely do not know about any Veronica. Afterwards, Free and Malia make a stop to eat some lunch. Malia tells Free that the scholars seem to have lied to them, but Free dismisses her opinion, saying that they could have been in a tight spot to reveal anything. Patricia and Jonathan Paspierre, also a Gui Carlin member, sit at a table across from theirs, acting like some strange chatty couple and successfully steal the briefcase with the tome papers from Free. The latter realises that they have been tricked a few seconds after Jonathan suddenly disappears from his chair. Yet again, another pursuit begins. They end up at an old, abandoned church. Some stairs lead them down to an underground chamber. The candle-lit passages are filled with empty liquor bottles and dead bodies. The duo gets attacked with gunshots. Free orders Malia to hide in a coffin while he goes after the thieves. Free is still puzzled at the fact that the two didn't run away from the scene after stealing the tome. Why are they trying to lure him in, or could he be the target? Just as the thought clicks, Patricia attacks him. Malia gets out of the coffin, but Jonathan is already waiting for her. He lights a candle. She starts shooting, but since she is surrounded by the dead bodies, it is difficult for her to aim at him. Malia thinks back to her childhood, how unlucky she was. She had envied Veronica for being surrounded by people and laughter while she had nobody. Jonathan's voice keeps echoing as he talks about capturing Malia to use her as bait in case Free becomes too dangerous. He starts attacking her, but Malia starts running towards the opening of the chamber. While climbing up the stairs, Jonathan calls himself an artist. Malia realizes that she is only running and decides to take aim, but he is already at her feet. Jonathan calls pain a blessing as he stabs her. His sinister, wide-eyed stare makes him quite creepy. Malia painfully tries to drag herself away from him. She is still unable to summon her fairy. 
Jonathan takes slow, predatory steps towards her and sadistically continues talking about his ideology of understanding her more by giving her pain. Suddenly, a loud crash through the church window interrupts them. Malia's saviour makes quite the entrance. It's Veronica in the flesh. In UE 491, Malia was still living with her adoptive parents called the Jürgens. On a cold, windy night, while walking with Mr. Jürgen, she mustered up the courage to ask if she was to blame for her father's death. He vaguely replied that some might think that way. Then she inquired about her mother. Mr. Jürgen monotonously relays that she wouldn't be the first to die during childbirth and assures Malia that she isn't a little disaster like everyone calls her. During UE 493 Fuzan, Veronica lies on the cold, hard ground, thinking how the war had snatched away everything she had ever known. In UE 497 Sooner, Moorlia looks for Veronica anywhere and everywhere. Then, during the same year, in Tubal, capital of the former territory of Kilo, the new duke, Ray Dawn, meets the awaiting crowd. The citizens are impressed by his humble and kind demeanour. Veronica is amongst the people in the crowd with a loaded gun, ready to shoot Ray Dawn for burning down Sooner. One of the guards is about to shoot her, but Ray Dawn intervenes and stops her with his fairy's power. A few months later, Malia is still looking for her, while Veronica lies on the hard floor inside a house. She feels numb with vengeance on her mind. Back to the present day, Veronica starts fighting Jonathan. He summons his fairy Jenny Hanover. Jonathan fills it with knives. It swells up and releases them on Veronica. <laughs> on the other hand, Patricia's fairy Boneless is busy swallowing up Red Hood. Patricia is quick on her feet and quite agile. She effortlessly attacks free. He's impressed with her moves. Then there is Jonathan, with tricks up his sleeve. First, he hides inside his fairy and then fills it up with oil. It bursts and he lights up a matchstick and sets a ring of fire around Veronica. Freeze had enough. He pushes Patricia back with so much force that it breaks both of her swords. He angrily warns Red Hood to get back into his senses. Patricia hides behind a pillar, loading ammunition. Jonathan swings from a chandelier like a madman. His fairy gets filled with oil again and he lights up the match. This time, Veronica's clock also gets burned. Malia watches from afar, yearning to help Veronica somehow. She gathers up all her remaining strength to summon her fairy. Ashclad successfully makes an appearance. She throws fire at Jonathan. He is wonderstruck by her. She goes back as Malia's legs give out. Veronica runs towards her and helps her get out. In the underground chamber, Patricia is trying to shoot Red Hood, but he throws the rifle away from her. Free comes to stand in front of her and pushes her ammunition case towards her, but she grabs it and runs. On her way out, she throws the black fairy tome briefcase at his feet and cackles. Veronica takes Malia outside to safety. The latter is reminded of that fateful night when they were kids. She thanks Veronica for saving her and tells her that she knew in her heart Veronica would have made it to safety because she herself was able to live. Malia gets to know that Veronica has still not given up on taking revenge on Ray Dawn. She tries to change Veronica's mind, but their eyes lay on Jonathan coming out of the fire while talking crazy. Veronica runs towards him with her knife. He sees her and runs towards her like a madman. She slashes his stomach and launches her fairy at him. Blood Daughter kills him. Malia is petrified to see Veronica's ruthlessness. She warns Malia not to follow her because her innocent childhood friend lives no more. Malia can't catch up to her due to her wound and helplessly calls after her as the grass behind Veronica gets engulfed in flame. Free makes it to safety through a sewerage line. Later, during the night, Wolfran goes to meet the Duke of Habstadt to inform him about his departure. The Duke asks his current purpose of life. Wolfran plainly replies that this is the only choice he's got. The Duke bursts out laughing and agrees. At the Dorothea headquarters in Rondacia, Malia's wound has been patched up by Eleanor Need from the medical technology department. She jokes about Malia getting hurt, even though Free was there with her because of the whole man protects woman thing. Malia awkwardly tells her that she doesn't know much in that department. Alina then proceeds to check her heart with a specialised X-ray tool. The heart looks completely normal, with no sign of fairy organ transplant. Dorothea members go out to a nearby pub to celebrate Malia joining the agency and her first successful mission. Some old men are already sitting there. Malia asks about them. One of them is named Gon and calls himself the hero of the Great War. He was a captain in the military during that war and the second one next to him is his soldier. 
the members catch up with each other and gossip about Director 9 for being too uptight to join the party. However, Clara disagrees and tells them that she owes her life to Nine. Gunn brings them a wine bottle to celebrate the members' security duty for the upcoming end of war anniversary ceremony. Just like that, their night comes to an end. In UE 496, at Rondesia Palace, in unified Zeskia, when the war ended, the King of Sidal, Golban Helways, gave up his crown to the Emperor Castal Harrell and became the Prime Minister the following year. Five other men were given territory for playing an exceptional role in the war. They are now referred to as the Five Dukes. Unfortunately, the system didn't prosper for long because Patrick Starry, the Duke of Widonia, was caught conspiring the Prime Minister's death. He ended up taking his life by drinking poison before his trial could even take place. Then, there was the Duke of Nova Ewan Breeze. A rumour about him causing a rebellion made him so furious that he actually decided to start one. He was one of the seven knights and died while fighting. Then the Duke of Litrock, Umer Chujuman. This man revolted against the Prime Minister because of his own paranoia and ended up getting his head cut off. Gon tells Malia that instead of the Dukes getting all the glory, the ones on the front line like themselves should have received some recognition. Now, only seven days remained for the 10th anniversary of the war ending. Only two Dukes remained. Maybe they will have a face-off soon. At the Hybron's official residence, Ray Dawn comes to meet Schwartz Dees. They greet each other and seem to be on good terms. Inside the Dorothea HQ, a man is locked behind bars for pretending to have a fairy primordial. He claims that it was only to earn some money. Robert Chase and Osmer from Dorothea spot an artificial fairy soldier outside a shop. They go inside to talk to the salesman because it's illegal to have any if they happen to be original products. Free and Malia are walking down a street with Chima. They walk past the Zern 1 Artificial Fairy, a new model introduced to provide security for the 10th anniversary ceremony. Chima suddenly starts running back. It stops in front of the new model of artificial fairies. One of them seems to have malfunctioned and is about to attack a woman and her little girl. At a corner further away, a man hides while blowing another whistle to control the artificial fairy and cheekily runs away. Later, Free and Malia visit Griff Mercer from the Ministry of Fairies to see what had caused the artificial fairy to malfunction. They are told by the military mechanic Hans Fmed that Griff is the assistant of the vice minister. Griff informs them that nothing seems to be wrong with the artificial fairy, but of course the higher-ups won't like this explanation. At the Dorothea HQ, Free and Malia are informed by Director 9 that the black fairy tome which they secured is indeed a fake one. However, this time, it might be the real deal. For this new mission, she decides to send Malia with Clara to Escreque, a former territory of Cinquenje. They go inside a shady-looking bar to meet Buzz, the informant. He already has been paid by the organisation, but he demands for money in exchange for information regarding the Black Fairy Tome. Suddenly, his men attack Malia and Clara from behind, but they swiftly block their attack. Before Buzz can even fire at them, they both already have a knife against his throat. He gets frightened and spurts out that this was all merely a joke. Robert and Free interrogate the man whose command the artificial fairy failed to obey. He is still unable to figure out what could have possibly gone wrong. Back at the bar, Buzz becomes all obedient and polite. He arranges a vehicle for the ladies. It turns out to be a cruiser motorbike. Buzz informs them that at an auction, the Black Fairy Tome was sold to a well-known agent named Dice. This particular Black Fairy Tome is called the Black Four. The duo spots him getting into a vehicle. They decide to follow. Damien peeks from a corner, looks like he has already heard the rumour and has also arrived. Dice goes inside the train station. They follow him while keeping a distance. He gets on a train. They are able to catch up to him the last minute. Veronica is already at the ticket counter as well. Guy Carlin must have heard the news about it as well. However, to her dismay, the train leaves before she can board it. Damien watches her leave the station. Inside the train, they search each cabin but fail to spot him. They decide to check the freight car on the next stop, just in case. As the train moves towards the next destination, Malia asks Clara how she joined the organisation. She tells Malia that she volunteered after her entire family got killed during the war. Director 9 had arrived just in time to rescue her from the filthy hands of some soldiers. At the next stop, there is no sign of him inside the freight car. 
they hurriedly start looking around. Malia is able to spot his briefcase. They start chasing him, but he hides behind a wall thinking he escaped from them and starts walking like nothing happened. Malia holds the rifle to his back, making him stop in his track. At the Dorothea headquarter, Robert and Free start interrogating him, but he refuses to talk, even though the Black Four wasn't found in his briefcase. Malia points out that since he is an agent, he must have bought it for someone. Later, Malia asks Free about the malfunctioned artificial fairy, but nothing out of the ordinary has been found. Axel shows up out of the blue. He tells them that he would like to lend a hand with anything if needed. They take him to Dice. He recognizes him and informs them that he's rumored to work for a man named Gilbert Warlock. Sweetie, like always, is two steps ahead and has already reached his place. Present day, UE 505 at the Heavenly Gate Plaza in Rondacia, Osmer makes his way out of the gate. The man starts playing the flute again and more fairies malfunction. Sweetie meets Gilbert. He happens to be one of the four executives of the Gui Carlin Mafia group. She wants them to discuss matters over a drink, but he declines saying that he doesn't drink anymore. Sweetie cuts to the chase and asks him about the Black Four which he bought at the auction. She reminds him about the last time she had presented him with the Black Three. So this time she wants to be on the receiving end. He turns her down and tells his butler to see her out. Sweetie being Sweetie isn't about to give up so soon. A discussion about the malfunctioning artificial fairies takes place. Yakim Set, the minister of the Ministry of Fairies, wants to take custody of the ones not working properly in order to thoroughly examine them. However, Bruno Boma from the Ministry of Military disagrees. His point is that no matter what, these artificial fairies belong to the military. Marco Bellwood, the Vice Minister of the Ministry of Fairies, points out that it's their duty to look into fairy-related matters. Bruno retorts that the duty of the military is to maintain the peace of unified Zeskia. Nine sits listening to them going on about their duties, thinking they should be working together. Inside the investigation room at Dorothea HQ, Dice is still being interrogated. Robert wants him to confess about buying the Black Fairy Tome at the auction for Gilbert Warlock, but the man doesn't budge. The members ponder over the use of some sort of interrogation technique to get Dice talking. Serge suggests they barge into the Warlock residence and confiscate the tome. The idea does sound appealing, but Free reminds him that Gilbert is not only rich, he has connections with Goy Carlin. They have to be careful. Only three days remain till the end of the war's anniversary ceremony. At the Hybron's official residence, Schwartz has called Nine to put in a good word for the Minister of Military at the Ministry of Fairies. She tells them that Dorothea isn't taking any sides. Axel is happily eating when Sweetie shows up, asking him for a favor. He quickly reminds her that the last time they crossed paths, she shot him, and besides, they work with different mafias. Sweetie tells that since he is already on good terms with Dorothea, she wants him to leak information regarding the Black Four of the Black Fairy Tome. Dorothea members are told to go to the East End base because the Ministry of Fairies tech team has entered the military base to examine the malfunctioned artificial fairies. The whole thing has become political. Now, Dorothea has to get involved to supervise. At Unified Zeskia's Prime Minister Helwis's residence, Director Nine informs him about the Ministry of Fairies visiting the base for the examination. She advises him to keep the new model of artificial fairies out of the anniversary ceremony. Helwis wants her to put the king at ease. At the base, the artificial fairy is synchronized with its operator to set its orientation. Hans tells them that only the synced operator can control it. The artificial fairy activates without any problem. Free asks if Hans believes they were really malfunctioning, but the man tells him that the decision is up to the higher authority. Daniel Keyes from the security bureau, whom Robert claims to be an old colleague, informs him that the Bureau believes someone from the inside is responsible for the malfunctioning. They must have some sort of connection with the military. Free and Malia are coming back from the base when Free's eyes fall upon Wolfran walking in the crowd. Free immediately runs after him. The man disappears out of sight. However, Axel surprises them from behind. Free pushes him against the wall and inquires about Wolfran Rowe's whereabouts, but he claims to have no clue. Free insists on paying a large sum in exchange for info about Arkane's scheming, if any, for the end of war anniversary. Axel again tells them that he isn't aware of any. He informs Free that somebody desperately wants to meet him, but unfortunately it isn't the man he's looking for. They enter a bar, only to find out the mentioned person happens to be Sweetie. 
Over dinner, the Prime Minister tells Schwartz, Dees and Ray Dawn that they are the only friends he has got now. He humbly tells them that he didn't start the war only to win it, but rather took a chance for unification and just went with the flow. The victory was truly of those who survived the war and will soon celebrate its anniversary ceremony. They agree with him. Wolfran tells a man in cloak to keep up the good work. On the other hand, Director Nine is taken aback when she hears about Sweetie contacting Free and Malia. They tell Nine that she wants them to join hands to secure the Black Fall. It does sound like a good idea since they would get the chance to meet with Gilbert Warlock. But the thing is that he happens to be one of the four Gui Carlin executives referred to as ear, nose, eyes and mouth. Robert and Free discuss the possibility of Wolfran involved in the malfunctioning of the artificial fairer. After all, he was part of the military during the war. Malia and Clara dress up for their visit to the Warlock residence along with Sweetie. Her terms are simple, to look over the contents on the Black Four before handing it over to Dorothea. Meanwhile, Robert is at the base and asks Hans about a man named Eddie Lloyd, former mechanic of the Security Bureau. Hans's right-hand man, Ted Livingston, seems to not like where the conversation is heading. Hans proceeds to tell him that the only thing he knows about Eddie is that he had left the job about seven to eight years ago and disappeared out of sight. Robert finds out that Eddie Lodi was the designer for the old model, Sidon the Seventh of the Artificial Fairies. He further informs Nine that the man was awarded by the Prime Minister for his dedication and was later given the charge of the unified Zeskia's Artificial Fairies Maintenance Division. This assignment was actually a demotion rather than a promotion. Eddie had several times requested for any reassignment, but was declined, so he decided to resign. Rumour has it that afterwards he joined Arcane. Nine wants Robert to share this information with the Security Bureau. Gilbert finally makes an appearance, but his answer remains the same, even after seeing two more ladies. Veronica shows them to him like some sort of display pieces. She proceeds to tell Gilbert that she is not interested in taking away the Black Four, but only wants to take a look at it and again reminds him of the Black Three she had personally given to him. Besides, what could possibly go wrong if he just showed them the tome, unless he doesn't possess it anymore? Gilbert vainly says that no one could dare steal it from him. This confirms that he actually has it. Outside a bar, Robert and Daniel talk about Lloyd. Daniel thinks that the man might be dead by now. Robert says that he might still have someone close left behind. Their suspicion is on Hans Fmed. Veronica relays that she comes bearing gifts, the gifts being Dorothea members. Gilbert's expression turns to a concerned one because he just admitted to having the Black Four and is in a bind. His men point their guns at them. Clara already has her fairy Tomaries hiding in the bushes. It signals the rest of Dorothea members to ambush and attack. Veronica summons her fairy Skriker. His men start shooting at them, but with Skriker's ability, they themselves receive the hits. Malia launches Ash Clad at Gilbert. She throws him to the ground. Gilbert isn't left with any choice but to comply. His men drop their weapons. Veronica smugly walks up to him. He angrily remarks on her shamelessness for joining hands with Dorothea. At the East End base, Daniel with his team from the Security Bureau takes away hands to inquire him about the malfunctioning of the latest artificial fairy model. At the Warlock residence, the Dorothea members have stormed in and started their search, while Gilbert walks the women through an underground passage. Clara wants to wait for the rest, but Veronica refuses because Gilbert might have a trick or two up his sleeve. They walk into a room. He goes to the fireplace and opens a secret door. Sweetie shows her cunningness by grabbing the keys from his pocket and rushing through the door, leaving them behind. Free arrives at the scene a little too late. On returning to the base, Robert sees Ted running after the vehicle, taking away hands. He's taken aback by Daniel already taking hands into custody. Back at the Warlock residence, Serge tells Clara that he is glad she is safe. Free summons Red Hood to break through a wall. It leads to another passageway. While walking through it, they come across a room full of fairy-related things, such as fairy primordial bottles, old models of artificial fairies. But most of all, the Black Four lies open on the table. However, Sweetie is nowhere in sight. Free sees a small opening near the ceiling. She must have escaped from there. Robert goes inside the interrogation room. He tells Hans that the new model of artificial fairies is symbolic, both for unification and for end of war. Therefore, the matter is quite serious, so he should come forward with whatever information he is hiding. 
At the base, the technicians from the Ministry of Fairies discover a hole inside the artificial fairy. It looks like something was installed inside it and then later removed. Serge gives this information to Nine and she relays it to the Prime Minister. He decides on not using the new model for the anniversary ceremony in case they malfunction again. Back at Dorothea, the members wonder if Hans truly is the culprit. Maybe he was bitter about not being part of the development of the new model of artificial fairies and decided to turn them into a failure. However, just to make sure, Robert goes to investigate Eddie Lloyd's personal life before drawing any conclusions. The new model is put into a warehouse. The old version is back on duty. Robert questions a man about Eddie. He tells him that he has a son, whom he even brought to work twice. It is news to Robert because nothing about a son was mentioned in the records. It's D-Day, the end of war anniversary has finally arrived. Ted also shows up at the celebration. Robert tracks down Eddie's ex-wife's shabby-looking house and asks her about her son. Then he goes back to the interrogation room to meet Hans. He gives him the new information he obtained. Ted's mother raised him on her own, so she gave him her son name. Robert proceeds to point out that even though Hans's intentions were good, Ted might be up to no good. What if he's out there messing with the new models while Hans stay unaware of it? This makes Hans realize something. Ted could use an override function in the old model. Robert looks puzzled with this information. Hans further confesses that in the beginning he was unaware of Ted being Eddie's son but the boy kept working hard even after his father's disappearance, so he let him be. Furthermore, Ted wasn't involved in the development of the new model. However, he could still use some illegal device to cause the new ones to malfunction. In the old version, Eddie had installed an override option, which, when activated, could give him controls over all of the artificial fairies in audible range of the override pipe. He could give them whatever command he wishes. However, to use the override option, he would have to change to outer frame since it's sealed. He thought only Eddie knew how to do it, since the man was given shelter by Arkame, so this means that Arkame is going to cause trouble once again. Basically, ground for destruction has been successfully laid down. Hans now regrets that he has neglected Ted's feelings for far too long and wants Robert to save him. The boy is like a son to him. Robert reaches the ceremony as soon as he can. Prime Minister Golban Helwis comes to greet the people, Schwartz Dies and Ray Dawn by his side. The crowd gets louder and louder while cheering for unified Zeskia. In the crowd, Veronica, Damien and Wolfran are also present. Robert informs the others about Ted. Nine gives them the permission to arrest him. However, he has already climbed to the top. The Prime Minister, completely unaware of Ted's presence, stands in front of the crowd as the artificial fairies lift the flag. Ted looks at him with spit. He thinks about how Golban got rid of those who once stood by him just because they felt like little hurdles to him, just like his father. Ironically, Golban in his address talks about unification and sacrifices made by the people. The crowd suddenly starts panicking. Golban soon realizes why, when the artificial fairy soldiers get in position to attack him. The Dorothea team reaches them just in time to stop Ted. <laughs> Schwartz jumps in front of the Prime Minister to protect him while Ray doesn't even move a muscle. Ted gets arrested. He is furious and calls Golban a dog. He tells them that his father was the one who designed those artificial fairies, but his honour was snatched from him by Golban, which is equivalent to getting killed. Free reminds him that the war is long over and people are getting judged the right way, so killing Golban won't be the solution to Ted's misery, and at the end of the day, the Prime Minister is just a human. At the Imperial Castle in Rondasia, the King, Castal Harrell, praises Schwartz for his bravery and tells him to make a wish. Schwartz demands a fairy weapon. The King is taken by surprise with such a demand. At the pub, Malia is having a drink with the old men. They talk about how there might be another war brewing. This time, it might be between Hybrance and Callo. At Callo residence, Wolfran informs Ray Dawn about Schwartz Dieser's skimming. At his residence, Prime Minister Helwis informs Nine Orla and Marco Bellwood that the fairy minister named Set will take responsibility for the incident during the ceremony and the position will go to Vice Minister Bellwood. Furthermore, Duke of Hybrons has requested for a fairy weapon as a reward from the king. And since the Duke of Callow is one of the seven knights and already has one, they need to balance it out. Helwis wants Bellwood to take out the fairy weapon from the vault and have Dorothea transport it. Nine can already sense more trouble brewing but doesn't mention it. 
At the Ministry of Fairies, the Deputy Commissioner Glyf Mercer takes Malia and Free to the vault where the fairy weapons are kept. The seven knights were given a fairy weapon during the War of Unification. The weapons are stored inside glass cases. They have killed many fairies during the war. These fairy weapons have their own names. Pain Sealer, Fraternil, Verosteal, Aliadra. These four remain in their cases under strict security, while Sororius is with Ray Dawn. Free informs Malia that Nines is Aliadra. She had heard the rumor that a woman is one of the knights, but didn't know about Nine. Mercer asks about Verosteel belonging to Free. The latter says that it was only anointed to him by someone. Fraternil will be given to Schwartz Dieser. It originally belonged to the chief knight in Garland Battle during the Great War. In the outskirts of Rondacia, B.V. Lescar tells Schwartz that he is going to have a fantastic time in Rondacia. Apparently, Schwartz has arranged something for him. At the Rondacia train station, Frantel has been handed over to the Dorothea members for safe delivery. Schwartz shows up with his men, concerned about Nine not being the one to deliver it. She assures him its safety with the assigned members for the task. Schwartz, out of the blue, says that the peace has been achieved after a lot of bloodshed and hard work. He doubts anything would happen. Nine doesn't say anything, and the train starts moving. Inside the train, the Fraternil has been secured with chains and the Dorothea members are guarding it. Schwartz also sits inside the train. At Dorothea inside the interrogation room, Robert questions Ted about getting involved with Arkham and Wolfran Rao. Ted is too depressed to even say anything. Robert urges him to come out with the whole truth in order to avoid going to jail by getting pardoned for his crime. Who knows, he could even get a chance for a fresh start. Robert tells him to make things easy for Hans's sake since he thinks of him as his adoptive son. Upon hearing the man's name, Ted breaks down crying. The scene switches to the band of mercenary, positioned over a hilltop with rifles. B.V. is present as well, sitting with his subordinate Sophie. It looks like he has organized an ambush. The sun is about to set when Wolfran appears behind them with a letter for B.V. It reads that Nine Aula is staying behind in Rondatia. This means he is about to ambush the train containing Fraternil and was probably waiting for Nine to be on it as well. He is disappointed with the news and offers Wolfran to join them in the attack, but he declines saying that's not the part of his job. Malia has accidentally dozed off on Free's shoulder and gets flustered when she opens her eyes. She apologizes for it, but Free looks unbothered. In another cabin, Schwartz tightens his seatbelt, saying it won't be long. He seems to be anticipating for the destination to arrive short, unless he is aware of Beavy's ambush. The train driver sees a person standing on top of the rail track and pulls the brake while yelling at them to get out of the way. The person happens to Sophie. She shoots him dead. Beavy summons his fairy Eisenkopf. It attacks the train with so much force that it gets derailed and topples to the ground. Flashbacks of a man named Victor starts playing in Malia's head. The way he carried her home while she was sick and afterwards shows her how to hunt with a rifle. Later, she takes care of him in sickness and buries him after his death. She wonders if it happened because she is a cursed child. As soon as Malia opens her eyes, Free tells her that they are under attack. They take cover behind the train with the rest. Free knows that the enemy is after the Fraternil and tells them to make it their top priority. Oz volunteers to go get it. Free and Malia provide cover. As they're about to turn, Free sees Beavy and worriedly tells them that he is one of the seven knights. The man was against unification from the beginning. Beavy holds his fairy weapon Gadfact in his hand while yelling at the Dorothea members to stop him if they can. Free decides to bring out Fraternil since it's the only way to stop B.V. and to keep it safe. Lily Heinemann, one of the Dorothea members, goes to distract him with the rest. He launches Eisenkopf at them. Oz rushes towards B.V. and summons his fairy, Yale, to fight. They are no match in front of the knight. He chops off Yale's leg and goes to attack Red Hood. Then he proceeds to attack Free. The latter blocks his Gadfax with Fraternil. Free is still weak compared to him. Ashclad also joins the battle. Marla is about to shoot Sophie, but Beavy's warning saves her. She is about to kill Malia, but Oz steps in just in time. One of Beavy's men shoots Ashclad and his own team member. The hit affects Malia and she faints. Oz carries her while running. Sophie keeps shooting at them. Oz gets hit. Free still hasn't managed to hit Beavy. Oz can no longer walk due to the gunshot wounds and falls. Beavy comes from behind, telling him that his body won't be able to properly function again from the injuries he just sustained. Therefore, he will do him the favor of ending his life and kills Oz with Gadfatch. It's raining. Gloomy weather casts over the Dorothea headquarter. 
Three of the members have lost their lives from the previous night's failed mission, including Oz. Free blames himself for the loss. Nine comes to see the dead bodies. She reminds them that mistakes have been made, and most importantly, the Fratanil has been stolen. But this doesn't mean that they should stand still. They need to keep on moving forward and fight because that is their duty. Oz's body is handed over the Ministry of Fairies for the removal of the fairy organ since it's illegal to have it, but the Dorothea members are allowed to keep it because they use the fairies to keep the people safe. Clara tries to cheer up a sad Malia, reminding her that they have been given quite a difficult job in order to maintain peace. However, Malia believes that people around her die because she is a cursed child. At the Ministry of Fairies, the Vice Minister is reading the Black Four of the Black Fairy Tome when Mercer walks in. He tells Marco that the fairy organ removal has been completed and asks about the Black Four. Marco tells him that it is definitely complicated to understand and people like Gui Carlin would simply not have been able to even comprehend it. At his place, Schwartz Dies stands in front of the Fraternil, smiling smugly. The scene switches to the Dorothea members with their low spirits. Free instructs they go to the Callow inspection while Robert stays behind to assist Neen. On the way to Callow, Malia thinks back to the time she moved from Suna to Callow after the village was burned down. On a snowy day, a hunter named Victor had saved her and took her with him. He taught her how to survive in the world. However, soon he fell ill and died. The members meet the Duke, Ray Dawn. He takes them to where the fairy weapon is stored and tells them that in all these years he hasn't touched it. Before coming for the inspection, Free had informed them to look for the agreed parameters being followed by Ray Dawn. Malia keeps giving him a stare. He asks about it because she isn't the first to do that. Malia nonchalantly asks the reason to which Ray Dawn replies that ever since the unification some have been calling him a traitor. The Dorothea members are eating when Malia requests to visit someone in the city. Free tells her it can be arranged if nothing else happens. Later at night, he wonders how every time he gets to be the one to survive, thinking about Jet dying during the Unification War and now Oz. At the Bikali residence, Jingle, the head of the Bikali Mafia group, is hurriedly informed by his subordinate Dikidoro Diki about Malia's arrival. Jingle rushes to meet her and greets her like family. She tells them that a lot has happened since she left, such as joining Dorothea, meeting Veronica, even though the woman told her not to contact her ever again. She even shows her gratitude for when he appointed her as his bodyguard even though she wasn't qualified for the position. They gladly listen to all that she has to say. Serge and Clara had sneakily followed Malia to the Beaclay residence and wonders her connection to him. On the other hand, at Hapstedt, Dieza is practicing how to wield the Fraternil. This man is definitely up to no good. At the Dorothea HQ, on further interrogation of Ted, it has been revealed that Wolfran Rowe had frequently met him and Arkham even provided him with the interrupt device for the new model. Nine wonders what BV is up to because that man is a fan of war. Free joins Serge and Clara. He decides to go inside. In no time, the room gets crowded with the three also joining them. Jingle is taken aback when Free tells him that they dropped by just to say hello. He further says that since he was the one who made Malia join Dorothea, he is responsible for her. Jingle gets upset and utters that Free doesn't look like a determined man nor does he appear to be brave. Moreover, at Biakle, everyone is like a big family and Malia is like a granddaughter to him. How can he entrust her to someone coward like Free? The latter tells him that even though he may be a coward, but he is capable of protecting her, and even though they are not a family at Dorothea, but they are definitely comrades and look out for each other. Malia is reminded of Oz's face as he died. She still thinks people are dying because of her. Free gets all sentimental and goes down on one knee, requesting Malia to stay and reminds her of her goal when she first joined Dorothea. Later, sometime during the day, Dickie tells Jingle that Malia has a fairy now. They can somehow get her out of Dorothea. Jingle disagrees, telling him to let her be. She has finally made friends and her wish to stay with them should be respected. Plus, Free seems like a brave man. At the Imperial Embassy, the ambassador of unified government is woken up from his night slumber. Tens of arcane vehicles enter the place. They are loaded with artificial fairies. One of the workers activates them with the pipe. The ambassador is tied up and ordered to leave the country because Hybrance is no more part of the unification, but a sovereign state. Schwartz has called for a rebellion. Dorothea gets the news about Schwartz's revolt. They set into motion, 
The Prime Minister is angry to say the least. Most of all, he feels betrayed. Duke of Highbrands had used him. No one suspected a thing and everything went according to Schwartz's plan. This also means that Schwartz was involved with Arkheim, since the group was behind the incident on the day of the ceremony. He had put on an act of bravery. Prime Minister orders Military Minister Boma to send a force to Highbrands within a day or two. However, this requires the use of artificial fairies, and the problem is that the old model has the override feature, so who knows when they can go haywire. The new model is less in number, but cleared from any interrupt devices, so they'll have to use those. On top of this, to ensure the mission is successful, Golban allows Director 9 to use her fairy weapon, Aliadra. He laments that the people only want for the leaders to stay at peace, but those power-hungry fools can't seem to understand this. At the Rondasia station, arms and ammunition is being loaded into the train, and from the east end, base trucks loaded with artificial fairies are being dispatched. On the main street of Rondasia, the soldiers march. Golban notifies the king about the Duke of Hybrance. He is disappointed and announces to strip the Duke's title. He wants Golban to defeat him. Director 9 is given Aliadra from the Ministry of Fairies' vault. As soon as the other Dorothea members arrive back to Rondasia, they are thrown into a war. No rest for these guys. Upon reaching the headquarters, they are informed by Eleanor that Director 9 has already left. This leaves Free in charge as her deputy. Now he has to deliver the letter from Ray Dawn to Golban himself. The Vice Minister takes him to the Prime Minister and introduces him. Free hands him the letter. In Habstadt, the War of Rebellion has already begun. Both sides are using artificial fairies. Nine charges towards the fort with her Aliadra in hand and climbs it with exceptional agility. No wonder she is one of the Seven Knights. She takes down the artificial fairies in a single blow and keeps going into the enemy territory. In the letter, Ray Dawn has written that he had foreseen the rebellion. Some reliable source must have informed him. Unbeknownst to them, the reliable source was none other than Wolfren Rowe. The battle is going on in the streets of Hapstadt. Robert is worried about Nine, but Lily reminds him that she is a knight. She can definitely handle it. Nine warns the enemy to surrender if they hold their lives dear to them. They drop their weapons, which takes her by surprise because how come they gave up so soon? BV walks the streets with his band of mercenary. Two soldiers tries to question him, but Sophie shoots them. The Prime Minister is still reading the letter. Apparently fighting the Duke of Hybrance is just a diversion. They get interrupted by one of the personnels barging in to let them know that the King's Palace is under attack while he is still inside. Artificial fairies start attacking the palace walls. At the East End base, more soldiers are dispatched towards the palace. Free hurries back to headquarter to inform the rest about the attack on the palace. Boma has already reached the palace gate with his soldiers and artificial fairy soldiers. The Dorothea members also set out to protect the palace. BV is still on the move, whistling as he walks with the rest of his ruthless band while killing soldiers coming in their way. His nonchalant demeanor makes him quite intimidating. On the other hand, Schwartz and Wolfran walk through an alley in hooded cloaks. Schwartz goes on about his aim for the independent state. He says that he will allow free use of fairies as opposed to unified Zeskia. He thinks that this way there will be more prosperity. At the Kalo official residence, the fairy weapon belonging to Ray Dawn has been taken out of its case. The rest of Dorothea members arrive at the west gate of the palace. It's on fire. Their firearm is no match against the enemy artificial fairies. Free wields a fairy weapon belonging to his late comrade Jet. He had entrusted Free with it in case something happened to him. The fairy weapon happens to be Vera Stale. It kills the artificial fairies with ease. From the way the enemies keep throwing bombs and setting things on fire, Free is certain that BV is responsible. The soldiers open fires at BV and his group. BV keeps walk in the open fire. Not a single one hits him. He is definitely unimpressed with their skills and takes out his fairy weapon Gadfatch. The military leaders are devising a plan to take down the enemy when one of the soldiers reports that a new enemy has been spotted and it happens to be BV, one of the knights. Boma is shell-shocked. Leskar advances towards the heavenly gate. Boma stands in the balcony with his men. He believes that the gate won't fall because it kept standing even during the Unification War. BV summons his fairy to change the course of history forever by damaging it. BV keeps advancing towards them, but yet again the soldiers keep missing every single shot fired at him. How is this even possible? Boma is still in disbelief about the heavenly gate getting damaged. 
He comes to his senses and orders his men to kill all the traitors. The minister can't stand watching anymore and decides to sort things out himself. Free Malia, Serge and Clara make it there. The place is in shambles. B.V. Lescar kills the soldiers while belittling them, calling them mere pebbles and dirt. While going after him, they see lifeless bodies of soldiers scattered in every direction. Military Minister Boma offers them to join him. Wolfran and Schwartz are walking through an underground passage when the latter starts reminiscing about the time Prime Minister Golban was still the king of Sidal. He had carried out an invasion on Tamun as ordered by the Emperor. It was during UE 481 when Wolfran was still just a child and Schwartz himself had newly joined the military. He thought it was crazy and maybe the order was fabricated. However, Wolfran then recounts that during the Battle of Garland, the Knight of Sidal took away the Emperor from his imperial capital, Masria, which was under Ledrad's control at that time. This changed the course of history because Ledrad always had the unwavering power by manipulating the king. However, the minister, Golban, overturned this by taking the Emperor into his hands. Schwartz Dieser really thought that after the unification, Golban would try to take the Emperor's seat, but it never happened. BV has made it inside the building and his fairy Eisenkopf is on a rampage creating havoc, killing soldiers left and right. His men also kill ruthlessly, though an artificial fairy kills one of them. Meanwhile, Boma takes the four of Dorothea members through a secret passage. It leads them to a room that is right on top of where the enemies are located. A soldier reports to Boma that backup has arrived for the West Gate. The backup turned out to be the Prime Minister himself along with his men. The mercenaries have taken cover while the soldiers waste their ammunition on them. Beavy is enjoying it immensely and reminisces about the time during the War of Unification. After a moment's rest, he jumps into action. He swiftly runs through the army of soldiers, killing them with his fairy weapon. He summons his fairy, which causes even more casualties, both to soldiers and artificial fairies. Beavy tells the soldiers to truly fight with all their might. Malia is running to get to Beavy. She thinks to herself about people fighting to the extent of death. She can't grasp the thought of going as far as that and finds it all so frightening. She musters up the courage to not run away because BV needs to pay the price for Oz's death. Tomarese, Clara's fairy, monitors the situation from inside. Upon Clara's signal, the soldiers and Dorothea members charge towards BV and his gang. Free lunges forward him with Vera Steel in his hand. BV has been waiting for this moment. They all watch the two fight head to head. Free manages to draw a bit of blood from Beavy's neck. The madman is getting excited over finally finding someone worth having a fight with. Free tells him that this is the era of peace, nobody asked for war. Beavy, however, is stuck in war life and summons his fairy. Free gets a flashback from when Jet told him to go forward when he feels stuck. The flashback gives him strength to fight. He pierces the fairy weapon into Beavy's fairy. The latter goes outside. Free follows after him. He summons Red Hood. It distracts Beavy long enough for Free to attack him. Free reminds him of Jet, but he claims that Free hasn't reached his level yet. Ashclad comes to his rescue. Free tells him that this is not a one-on-one -on -one combat, but rather Dorothea fighting with him. Serge launches his fairy to attack as well. Beavy still makes it out alive. His team throws a smoke bomb and retreats. Malia runs after them. Free follows her, telling her not to be so hasty, but she doesn't listen. On the other hand, Schwartz is hopeful that people will come to join his cause soon. He comes out of the passage and makes it to the king's throne room. He kills the king's men, leaving him all alone on his throne. Schwartz realizes that Wolfran is no more by his side. Ray Dawn appears from behind, telling him that the man has done his job. All this time, Schwartz has been double-crossed. Ray Dawn summons his fairy throne taker. All the irony, his fairy rusts up the enemy guns within seconds. Soldiers start running outside of the West Gate. The Prime Minister gets confused by it, but soon Beavy and his group appear through smoke. The Minister orders his men to fall back. On the other hand, Ray Dawn has killed Schwartz's men and severely injured Schwartz as well. He questions Ray about his flattery of the Prime Minister when he himself is so powerful. Ray tells him that he has always found Schwartz irritating and is glad to kill him for betraying the King. He finishes off Schwartz with his fairy weapon. Malria tries to run after Beavy, but Free stops her. He reminds her that their duty was to protect the palace, and they have performed their duty, and revenge is not part of it. She breaks down crying. He brings her into his embrace. She asks if they have actually won, he affirms. 
They all look at the rising sun, symbolizing their victory. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.